evening everybody I'm hoping that uh, the volumes okay today if you can just give me a sound check thank you Adrian it's good to see you We're just waiting for uh, lots of people to check in and uh, and and make it. Um, if you are here, um, give us a thumbs up or a wave. So that I know I've got Adrian up here, so I know Adrian's here. Uh, we got Robert. Hi, Robert. I don't know why the light is pulsing all of a sudden. It's a bit weird. Uh, hi Dave, how are you? So if you're wondering what I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at a laptop at the same time as uh, I've got the camera up. Hi, Chris. Thank you. It's good to be back on air. Try and make it a bit more frequently now. We're coming into the autumn. Don't forget, folks. Um, remember, today is primarily all about absolute beginners. Um, so we're going to start from real first principles. Um, so... Um, what really works and what has really worked in past sessions has been lots of questions appearing in the chat function. Um, and, uh, and I will try and answer as many of those as I possibly can. Um, and I'm sure that some of the guys that are also logging in, um, like Dave and some of the others will have ideas as well. Um, so, um, keep looking at the, uh, the chat function. Um, and, uh, if I miss a question, I'm sure one of my uh, esteemed uh, fishing buddies, probably Kieran, will give me a little nudge um, just to remind me, um, which would be fantastic. So we've got 10 people with us tonight um, so far. People will I've, people will be dropping in during the course of the evening. They always do. Um, and, uh, you know, this is this is really, really about where do you start? Because we have we've had an awful lot of um, posts up on the on the Facebook group 
um, and in other groups, to be honest, um, saying I've bought this kit or I, I'm thinking about buying this kit. I want to start tying my own flies. I want to get on the water and I want to catch fish with flies that I've made. Um, and, you know, it's a bit of a minefield when you start looking at all of the materials. It's a bit like anything, isn't it? Um, I suppose um, I was looking for um, a piece for uh, a replacement piece for my son's bike the other day. And, and who'd have thought that there are so many different variations of the same thing? Um, so and, and fly fishing is no different and fly tying is no different. But actually, you just need some basic kit to be able to uh, be able to tie up some flies that are going to catch fish. OK, um, so um, so as I said, um, we're here. Um, everything here will be recorded and is being recorded and will be uploaded to my YouTube channel, um, Lost Lake Fly Fly Club. Um, if you have a look on uh, on YouTube and you'll be able to uh, have a look, give me a like, subscribe because it gives me an incentive to put more and more things up there if I think people are actually uh, going to use it um, and uh, and we'll get some more uh, more material up there as soon as possible. Um, also, don't forget, um, if you don't, didn't already know, um, up in the document section of the uh, of the Facebook page. We've got some uh, step by steps of some of my favorite patterns so far, um, and they're rated um, with different complexities. Um, but uh, it's always worth having a look um, and I'll be adding more to those during the course of the autumn and winter season. And if there's anything in particular you'd like to see, um, we can get those up um, and, uh, and we can do a live video um, of tying of those. OK, right. So um, as far as I can see. No questions so far. So um, I'm going to start off right at the beginning. Um, really simple, really straightforward. Um, the one thing you actually are going to need, and most of us who tie have already got this, um, is a is a vice, a trusty vice, something that's going to hold that hook really, really steady, um, and it's not going to it's not going to bend, it's not going to pull, it's not going to move. Um, this is uh, an old vice that um, I still use today. It's got to be a good 30 to 40 years old. Um, one of the first original ones that we ever had. Um, and it does the job. Um, and I use it even now, um, even though I've got other vices that, that, uh, that have moved on with the, the technological advancement. Um, what are you looking for in a vice? Well, um, you're looking for one that um, ideally comes with a, a, a clamp to clamp it to a table. But if you can also get a pedestal base as well, um, that's absolutely fantastic. If it doesn't come with a pedestal base, you can pick them up on eBay uh, for not a lot of money, to be honest. Um, or if you're very handy, you can make your own, I suppose. Um, so um, what else am I looking for in, in, a, in a simple vice? Um, I wanna be able to open and close these jaws very simply. Um, this one has got a turn disc type tightening action others have got levers um, this one is quite nice because you can it, it's almost like a ratchet you can you can just adjust it very 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 carefully so that you can get it to the right um, right uh, grip on your hook um, this one in, as well enables me to tilt not all of them do some of them are fixed but if you can get a tilting one tilting vice um, that'd be fan that's fantastic as well. Um, also, if you're buying second hand and you're buying off eBay um, and there's lots out there, just ask some questions and get some close up photos of the jaws to make sure that they're not um, they're not damaged and they're not pitted um, and uh, and that they actually open and close properly because the jaws, you don't want to be replacing those in a second hand vice. Um, because that's just going to cost more money. OK, um, so, um, you know, don't jump into the first one you see um, on eBay. Um, but like with all things, you get what you pay for. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of terms of vices, we've those of us that have been tying for a long time have gone through um, a metamorphosis of our of our vices and and we 
I use different vices for different things. Um, I've got one vice that I like to tie uh, um, uh, salt water flies on because it's got a great set of jaws. And then I've got my my trusty, wonderful vice that, that I have that is my, my vice that I tie all of my river flies on um, because, it again, it does a job that the other one can do, but it's just not as good. OK, so um, don't forget, um, you know, as you're joining us, questions up, please, because uh, otherwise it, um, uh, it's always good to have a bit of interaction um, with people. If there's a question that, uh, that you that you want answered um, afterwards. Just let us know. And um, so the vice, um, you know, really important in the early days, people would have held everything in their in their thumb and their finger and tied like so. But you want to be able to hold it steady. You want to be able to bring it up to eye level. There's no point in tying all the way down, um, low down. Because at the end of the day, you want to see as much of that fly as you possibly can. If you if you if your vice as well can rotate so you can look at both sides. That's fantastic as well, but it is not essential. That comes a little bit later um, at this point. We're just interested in being able to hold on to that hook and tie a fly. And the second, there's loads of different pieces of equipment that are, that, that are available, hundreds, in fact. And some of them, um, you know, you might only ever use once because you want to tie a particular fly. Um, but the key things that you do need um, are very simple devices. So here's an example of a very simple um, uh, ceramic bobbin. Um, here we've got the end sections here. These clip on to a spool and the thread goes up through the tube, comes out the top and it holds it nice and taut. OK, so you don't need to spend tens of pounds on these initially. Um, you know, uh, there's some really good sets out there that you can get hold of. Um, and uh, if you can, if you can eventually... Um, have one or two because sometimes it's a pain to just keep swapping over. That's fantastic. Um, what else do you need? Uh, oh, you definitely need. What else have I got here? Uh, I'm going to come to the most important bit later on. Um, I've got hiding here um, a pair of hackle pliers. So spring loaded hackle pliers. These are really old. These ones. Um, I inherited these um, and these hold on to feathers and other materials so that you can actually wrap them around the hook um, and not let go of them, which will often happen with your fingers. A um, pair of hackle pliers don't have to be expensive. Again, you can have the spring loaded ones like this, the spring jawed ones. But there's another type that looks like this, um, which you pull down and it acts like a clip, like so. I don't know if that's in focus. There we go, like so. Um, there are others that rotate, um, but you just need a simple, a simple one. Everything is about starting off simply. Um, a needle is a good idea. This is a, this is called a dubbing needle. Um, comes in useful for absolutely everything. Um, things that you never even thought that you'd ever need to use it for. Um, so um, uh, the, I particularly like this one. This is a Stonfo um, uh, one because um, it's got a hexagonal. Um, shape around here so it doesn't roll off the desk. Um, you're also going to need a whip finish tool. Okay, um, a whip finish tool. Um, so, you know, there are different ones on the market um, and different types. There's two different types. Uh, this is a Mattarelli style um, and this is a much um, loved style um i find it far easier than the other style um, um and i think it's a bit more intuitive to use most people that i speak to use one of these um i was taught very early on to do it by hand um if you can get to grips with that that's absolutely fantastic as well um, but we've got um, a whip finish tool again doesn't have to be expensive i'm um, dr slick actually do a nice set and I know there's a loon set as well that is very 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 good as well um, most of these things do come in the fly tying kits but we're going to come on to those 
um, in a little bit. And remember, a lot of this is just um, my opinion on those. Um, I've also got here, which is a threader. OK, so this is a threader for your bobbin. So you place it into the tube. Like so. Oh, in it goes, I hope. Can't even see on it today. So it goes into the tube. Maybe it doesn't on that one. Um, that's better. So it goes into the tube, comes out, and then you place your thread through and then pull it. And it brings it all the way through. Um, saves you having to try and thread it through and it, it takes absolutely forever. Um, these you can pick up in sewing shops, haberdasheries, things like that for, for not a lot of money at all. Um, well worth having a couple of those because I always put them down um, and end up losing them. Um, so um, the final most important bit, apart from the vice, is your scissors. Um, it's good to have an array of scissors. Um, they need to be as sharp uh, and as good as you can possibly afford. Um, spending money on scissors when you're fly tying is not a waste of money. But it's very frustrating if they drop on the floor and they get blunted. So be very, very, very um, careful in what you're cutting with various scissors. So um, these are these are my preferred style. Um, these are a, a brand called Renomed. Uh, they're about 20 to 30 pounds um, for a pair of scissors, um, but they are razor sharp. Um, I only ever cut soft materials with these. Um, I have, if I'm going to be cutting anything that's pretty tough, I have a pair of uh, um, big shear type scissors for cutting things like, um, uh, like wires and things like that. Um, so, um, you know, have them in a, it's worth having in a, um, in a couple of different sizes, um, you know, down from small to medium, um, you will suddenly get a feel for the size and the types that you'll need to, uh, you'll, you'll, that are best suited for you. I've only got small fingers, so, um, you know, these small finger loops on, on here are perfect for myself. Um, but if your fingers are, are larger, um, then um, Anvil do a really nice set that have got these large loops, like so. Um, and, um, you know, it's a case of finding ones that, that actually suit your style. Now, our biggest issue as fly tires is that we don't have many shops that we can go and just try them out and f have a feel and have a play with them. Um, and this is this is always going to be a problem um, as, our, as our tackle shops and suppliers um, move to online only. Um, so it's always worth talking to people. It's always worth asking questions in the group. Um, uh, and it's always, it is definitely worth speaking to somebody in person and having a, having a look at their scissors, um, and just getting a feel for those. Um, okay. So let's have a look at some of these questions. So Eric says, uh, what's your opinion on rotating hackle pliers? I find them more effective than the static ones. I'll be honest, Eric. Um, I've never used one. Um, I just never felt the need to. Um, so I can't actually answer the question. I don't really have an opinion on them. Um, I, I do like using these. Um, but I don't use these for genetic hackles because they crimp the end of the genetic hackle. And I like keeping the ends of the genetic hackles um, to make wings. And if they're crimped, you can't. Um, so um, I've always just um, uh, made do with um, the, the jaw style like this. Um, it's just personal preference. Um, I, I'm sure that they're really, really effective. Just never got around to buying any. Um, OK, uh, thanks, Dave. Mattarelli style whip finisher is definitely the best. Um, Adam, uh, what brand of scissors could you recommend for a mid range price price? OK, um, I need to check the pricing, but um, Dr. Slick scissors are, um, are definitely worth having a look at and they do some nice mid range. Um, but. You know, you can't go far wrong, I suppose, with going to a haberdasher's or, um, you know, a, a 
a sewing shop and just having a look at, at, at some of the scissors they have there for embroidery and things like that because they're going to do a similar job um, and also they're probably going to be significantly cheaper to start us off um, but at the same time as I said if there's one thing you're going to spend money on apart from the vice eventually is your scissors your scissors are key you're going to use them more than anything else um, okay right so uh, i hope that helped um on those bits right so um you know we've got the key bits of hardware okay that's basically all you're going to need so let's just quickly go through that you need your vice a dubbing needle hackle pliers whip finishing tool and a bobbin okay to hold your thread okay then we get on to on to materials now i mentioned that we were gonna um we were gonna talk about a little bit about kits and sets so if you buy a fly tying kit to start you off you're going to end up with a lot of materials particularly materials that you're not going to use um, and might not necessarily be um, of any use to you at all in in your fly tying um, so i would suggest buying um, a, a toolkit um, the vice and then buying materials for a couple of flies that you learn to tie so that you can make sure that you get your techniques right because technique is most important once you've done that you can then start falling into the rabbit hole that is fly tying materials um, and, uh, and I, my fly tying materials seem to have taken over most of a room at the moment um, and I get moaned at left right and centre about it um, but I have stuff in my kit here that i've never used and i and I, I i just picked stuff up and went oh i could use that one day and i'm now going through a process where i'm just trying to reduce all of that down because there are things that i'm definitely definitely not going to use at all um so um you know um, it's always worth as well looking for job lots on ebay and there are some good ones out there um but also there are some people that are asking phenomenal amounts of money that, that the kit isn't worth just be very careful though because you might they might show you lots of pictures of boxes of hooks and things like that and actually there's only two or three hooks in there whereas but you really want the 25 or the 50 um, or as close as if they've been used so um, lots of lots of stuff um, that is um, you know that are pitfalls I suppose um, John says, uh, I use scalpels. So do I, John. I use scalpels an awful lot. I've got uh, an array of them here. Um, so there's there's one, um, particularly for cutting nano silks and really tough Kevlar style threads. Um, but also they're really good for just getting a really, really fine, nice nick. The problem with them is, though, is, is unless you've got really good control, is that one little slip, they're so sharp that they'll just take off. A massive amount um, uh, um, uh, 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 of your fly. Um, so, um, what else have we got here? Uh, yeah, Kieran, thank you. Yeah, dental floss threaders. I know you gave me a few of those. I'd forgotten about those. I've got those here. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, so fox squirrel tail and mole fur spring to mind. Got them in a job lot. And yeah, from Eric. Um, yeah, don't discount the mole though. Mole's re really, really going to become really useful. Um, but um, the fox squirrel, did you say it's a tail? Um, again, good winging material. Um, so you got a couple of good things there. So so yeah, so I would keep hold of those. Um, uh, you know, so. Uh, you know, just be really, really careful, though, um, about what you're buying. Um, and also, you know, just make sure that you look at um, you know, if people are selling stuff that what the reviews, the, the buyer reviews are like for those particular people. Anyway, let's move away from eBay um, at this moment. 
Um, so any more questions, guys, uh, um, that you have? Evening, David. Good to see you um, here. Um, in terms of the you know, materials, I you know that's a whole minefield of various things. But let's go. Let's look at some of the basic stuff that you're going to need. Um, you're going to need hooks. You're going to need hooks. Why? Because that's what's going to catch you the fish ultimately. Um, but uh, and, and if you speak to myself, or you speak to any of the guys that um, I can see that are logging in and, and are with us tonight. Um, we all have our own preferences. And in fact, I would say, and you can correct me here, guys, I would say that we all have different brands for different styles and types of flies that we tie. Um, so, for instance, um, I particularly like a partridge clink hammer hook um, for tying um, stimulators and, and, and flies like that. Um, but I much prefer to use, um, uh, for instance, for my clink hammers, um, uh, a fasner hook because they just do the job for me. Um, and uh, and I particularly like to tie um, things like my damsels, my, my uh, still water damsels on camasan hooks. Um, and, and but if I want to do want them barbless, I'm going to move and the fully mill do a really good range. Um, I have a particular love affair with uh, fully mills check nymph hook because I think it's a really, really versatile hook and it can be used to tie everything from dries through to buzzers through to to, to shrimp patterns. Um, so it's about finding finding uh, a, a brand that you like. Don't skimp. Buy the best that you can afford. Um, there are lots of uh, people selling hooks um, on again on eBay. Um, some of them, I'm sure, are absolutely fantastic. But there are a few that when I've used them, the fish have actually just bent the hook. The the actual um, tempering of the of the uh, of the of the steel is not good enough at all. Um, whereas, so now these days I stick with uh, with key known brands that I like to use. Um, just take particular note of what it says on um, the uh, the boxes as well. So if it says it's a super fine hook, as it does on some of the hens hooks. That means that it's going to be not particularly useful if you're if you're targeting big fish. It's going to bend out. Um, so that's you know really very much for um, for small uh, uh, stream trout, river trout, things like that. Um, whereas um, you can get some real heavyweight um, style hooks, both from Fulling Mill and others, um, and ultimately. You know they are pretty strong. You know they are pretty strong. You know they're gonna they're gonna deal with a a, a double figure fish. Um, uh, so, you know absolutely, um, you know find a brand that you like. Um, a good starting point is always going to be the Camasan range. Um, good value for money. Um, uh, definitely, um, if I'm buying Camasan these days, I'm a bit of plug here for various people. Um, uh, Camasan I'm going to buy from um, the Fly Tying Boutique from Phil Holding. Um, I sell on, on my website Sprite Hooks, which are a very good um, uh, entry level um, uh, sort of hook. Um, come in packs of 50, so it's good value for money. Um, but there's a limited range. That's the only reason why I don't tie a massive amount on them. Um, but I do like them for... Uh, for shrimps, and I do like them for my dries as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's, let's have a look at... Um, let's have a look at what we've got here. So, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, Kieran, um, check quantities on packs. Um, fully, yeah, fully milled. They might look expensive, but you get 50, um, you, you know, Others are twenties and twenty fives. I I went and bought some um some hooks the other day for uh, to do some carp flies, and it was four pound ninety five for just ten hooks. Uh, you know, so we, we, I could buy fifty for that. 
um, on trout hooks. So, um, you know, just be just just make sure you read what it says. Um, let's have a look. What else have we got here? Um, yeah, Eric. Um, you know, uh, fully mill or camasan. Um, yeah, Dave, Davey is fantastic. He is sponsored by Fulling Mill, so that's all he's going to really tie with uh, most of the time. Um, okay, um, so, you know, and Camasan were his early, with the early, um, on his early videos, he always tied with a Camasan hook. Um, okay. Um, yeah, part, you can't beat partridge hooks at all. Okay, but um, just... Just know, and, and Kieran's made a good point there, um, and, and it's not a, a significant negative, um, but online tyres um, are, are, are often sponsored. I'm not. I just do it because I like it. Um, uh, if anybody's there and they want to sponsor me, please feel free. Um, but, you know, at the end of the... Um, so at the end of the day... Um, you know, just be just be mindful of things like that when people are, are suggesting things online. And, you know, I, I'm quite open. I sell lots of materials on my website from Semperfly, uh, from Vicuna Dubbing, um, and, uh, you know, uh, lots and, uh, and various others. Um, they're very good. They're absolutely fantastic. But when I see a good, uh, good deal, I'm always going to push you guys towards them. Um, so uh, what's Dave saying? Stick with the coarse fishing hooks for your carp flies, mate. So much. Cheaper. You'd think that I, you know, you buy in sort of suitable ones, corder ones and things like that. They were a fiver for 10 hooks. It was craziness. Um, so I ended up with some Drennan hooks, which was £1.95 for 10. Um, and they definitely caught us some uh, nice carp the other day. Um, so um, let's talk about thread. Very quickly, I'm, I'm mindful of time, so I would like to tie a fly for you tonight as well, so that you so you can see uh, and get a feel for it. Um, and I'm hoping this is helping any beginners that are with us. Um, so um, threads, it's a minefield. I got asked the question earlier on, could I suggest some threads for buzzers and, and things like that? Um, depends on what type of buzzer you, you're actually um you're actually wanting to tie if it's got a dubbed body and things like that it can be a rounded thread um if you're using the thread to develop the body itself um you go for a thread that you can flatten something like a utc um uh, they're fantastic for that um so um one of my favorite favorite ones is um you know semperfly you do um do these wax threads and they've upped their game on these massively um, and what we have now is beautiful spools that work fantastically well with a high tensile strength um, in a large variety of colours and sizes. Um, an 8 aught 8 slash 0, is perfect for the vast majority of the flies you're going to tie. If you want to go a little bit smaller, the 12, but just remember as you go smaller, the diameter decreases and you end up with theoretically a weaker thread there are threads like nano silk um, and dyneema and, and various others that have high tensile strength for their um for uh for the st for the thickness i'm losing my, my my words there um for the thickness um i like these threads um and and they also do uh um Semperfly also do a spider thread that is one of my absolute go-to's um, you can see here it is. This is my. This is the old style spool. Um, you know they work, but they're not great. The new spools are absolutely fantastic. Um, and this spider thread, you can see here, this is an eighteen or, and I use this an awful lot. Um, and there's not a lot left. Um, and I just like the red. Um, but it 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 actually helps me um, with my tying. What colours do you need? Well, I would suggest black brown olive and a white to start you off why the white because you can color it you can add some color to it with permanent markers and actually get a color um, a very different color um, don't start buying lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different colors go back to what i said earlier buy what you need to be able to tie a couple of patterns to get into 
the fly tying in total. Okay, um, so um, you know everything else is all about the in terms of materials is all about what you need for the flies. So um, again, I'm just I've got a couple of books here that are great starting points. Um, if you do not have a copy of Peter Gathercole's Fly Tying Bible, then you need to get a hold of one. Um, there we are an awful lot of people that um, that are putting up on the internet um, a PDF version of it for free, which you can download. Um, I would say if you're going to do that, buy a copy as well, because, um, you know, it, it, the money goes back to Peter, who's part of a part of our um, uh, of our fraternity. Um, but also, um, you know, it's really useful to have ooh, all bits are falling out. Though. I can see I've got things stuck in here. Um, it's really useful to have it so that you can open it in this ring binder format on a PDF. It's actually quite difficult to actually zoom in a little bit so you know it just takes time it's just another thing to do whereas you can have this in front of you um, and it's really beautifully laid out an absolutely fantastic book um, also the handbook of fly tying again by peter gathercole um, i have hundreds of books here those people that know me uh, will attest to that hundreds of fly tying books here um, this one is a go to. I go back to it time and time again when I'm looking for ideas or I'm just looking just to refresh my memory. Uh, I've been tying a long time, but I still use them all the time. And then finally, um, I know there's quite a few people on here today that are big, big fans of Barry or Clark. I'm one of them. Um, this is Barry's um, Fly Tying Techniques book, um, which again is well worth getting hold of um, all available on amazon um, or from most of them from cockabundi books as well that would be a preferred place to buy them from small businesses um, you know let's let's keep them going folks you know let's all support the small businesses so that they can keep providing us with cool materials and uh, and information so there's just a, a couple of examples of books um, if you can um if you can uh, pick them up secondhand, absolutely fine. But as I said, you know, it's, it's the the ethics in me. If you're going to have a PDF version that somebody's passed on to you for free, I'd suggest doing a decent thing and buying yourself a copy as well, because it is actually much, 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 much better to have it. Um, OK, so we covered key things there um what we're going to do now and it'll take me a second just to set up the camera so that it uh, that we can look at flies um i'm going to bring my vice into uh um into it like so and just adjust just bear with me please you don't want to see my scruffy beard Apologies for the gym kit, by the way, because I just spent an hour being destroyed by a personal trainer because um, I'm old. Right. So let me just try and get get that into play without deleting. OK. Hopefully that's going to be, hopefully you can see the fly. There. Just wondering if it's not going to like my t-shirt. Because um, it sometimes doesn't. So, um, so there we go. So this is a, this is a caddis um, that I tied up earlier on today um, for somebody. Um, so. Let me just adjust. So I'm not happy with the focusing there gonna focus I'll tell you what I will have to do is just drop my vice down a little bit it's, a, it's gonna focus on my beard I'm gonna drop that down a bit and then normally if I'm tying for you guys as you know normally I have it all set up ready to go um, 
and you don't see me, you just see the fly. Um, there we go. Okay, so I'm hoping that's going to be in focus now. Please tell me if uh, if it if it isn't. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try and keep as far away out um, as possible, um, so that um, so that we keep it everything in focus. Um, so, you know, in terms of flies tonight, I thought we just I'd just tie a very very simple um, uh, pheasant tail nymph. Because it's going to be a fly that actually everybody needs to have in their um, in their arsenal. Because without it, you know, and, and without Sawyer um, and, uh, and and skews, we would never ever ever um, be in a position to actually um, actually fish as effectively um, as we can. Now, in terms of hooks, I'm just going to use. Um, an old hook that I've got here. This is a this is an old hook that you can't get hold of anymore. This is a, a Jeffrey Bucknell um, wet fly size ten hook. I inherited it um, and uh, a, a whole load of them, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm going to place it in my jaws. So these are my jaws here. Um, I've got a um, a spring lever that's going to open and close them and I'm just going to place the hook in and I want the shank to not be at an angle like that I want it to be completely horizontal okay or as horizontal as I can get it so there we go right so there it is so we get it horizontal now it's a great hook, this one, because it's got this really nice long shank, downturned eye, it's barbed. Um, the gape here is theoretically what makes it a 10, not the length of the shank. So you can get 10s that have very, very short, stubby um, uh, um, shank lengths or slightly longer. For most nymphs, you want a reasonably long, I feel, a reasonably long um uh, shank because if you look at the nymphs under uh, you know when you if you do if you do a pond study or river study they're long <laughs> they just are they're long they you, you know they've got segmented bodies they've got different sections they, they they articulate they move they dart um so we want to mimic that with the fish we want to give them a good trigger point um so um next stage um i'm going to use a brown Semperfly brown thread. Don't know if you can see that. There it is. Semperfly. Uh, I'm going to use a 12 or here. Um, I don't have uh, many in an eight at the moment because I'm tying a lot of small flies. But I find this one is just as good. Now there'll be a there'll be a keeper section on the end of your uh, on the end of your spool. Just be mindful of that. I often find that it's actually really useful. To remove that if you're going to be tying with a particular color a lot just remove it you can always put it back on um, and the reason for that is because um, it, it I've discovered that it, it it makes it harder for the spool to actually turn um, and you end up with an increased amount of friction um, which means that you gain you're going to get more breaks okay um, I'm just fighting with my bobbin here because I just got it trapped. I'm going to use my my bobbin threader. So I'm going to push through. Now this is a CNF Designs bobbin. Um, fairly expensive in the £30 range um, but it's ceramic. It's got a foam insert um, which protects the thread. Um, I really do like this one. Um, it is my go-to at the moment. Um, that might change. Um, I'm going to place it through. I'm going to pull it through like that. And then I'm just going to pull. And through it goes. There we go. Okay, so I've got my bobbin all set up, ready to go. 
This is the bit you don't see on tie-in videos. They have everything already set up for you. Um, so, um, <laughs> uh, thanks, Dave. I was not going to mention that today. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, um, but for those of you reading that, um, I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but my preference is to have the hook point showing here because it actually is a really useful reference point um, for me as a tyre. Because um, fly tying is all about proportion um, and technique. Um, so you get the proportions right, you get the techniques right, everything else is going to follow. So you'll find that during this next part of the session, um, I'm going to talk you through various parts of um, the, the hook here and uh and how i'm going to use them so i've got my thread here what i'm going to do is going to lay the thread across the top okay across the top with the bobbin away from me and i'm just going to bring it down and under and over and i'm going to trap it trap the thread Oop, didn't work that time I'm just going to trap the thread i'm going to do that twice once twice maybe three times and that will trap the thread and your bobbin will hang real problems with the focusing today and let's move that forward so that there's more gray in the background okay that's better um and the bobbin will hang and gravity will do its work for us now this thread is pre-waxed i don't use a lot of wax uh, but it is useful um, a bit later on it is pre-waxed so um, everything's going to grip now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the tag end and I'm going to hold it out towards myself and then move it to a 45 degree angle from the hook shank and then I'm going to just turn my thread so that it's literally on the tag end and it doesn't matter if you've got a great big gap there because you can just push it and it butts it all up so that you can get nice touching turns. So it's very much a movement back and forth with your hand. Um, back and forth, back and forth. And you get these nice touching turns. Why is that important? Well, you're really looking for the fly to have the right proportions. Okay. Right. Um, so what we have here, so we've got the I've got some questions here. So, yeah, absolutely. We've got these things here. Uh, so, yeah, names of the section. So we've got the um, got the eye, we've got the shank, the bend here of the hook. Um, we've got the gape of the hook. We've got a barb. We've got the point. Um, there are other sections of it if you look at it in the technical manuals, um, but they're the bits that we need. Now, I'm going to use the tip of the point as my reference point, and I'm going to bring my thread so that it hangs in line with the tip. And I'm just going to look at that and just look at the length of the body. Now, I've got, let me just grab my dubbing needle, I've got a little bit more space to play with just by here. And that will bring me down, I hope, in line with the barb. There we go. So we're in line with the barb. Now you can see why I was quite eager to leave the hook point out so that I can actually reference where bits are. If you find that you've gone too far, take a turn off. Okay. It's always better to take a turn off. OK, then just to keep going, take your time. And then what you do is you take your scissors. This tag end I don't need at this moment in time. And I'm just going to play. I'm just going to open my scissors into a little tiny V like so. And I'm just going to place it. Either side of the thread and I'm not going to I'm not going to snip. I'm just literally just going to push. And let the blades just nip it off. OK, I didn't I haven't even I haven't even closed them. OK, so I'm just going to use the blade to do the work. Um, and that gives me a nice, tidy, um, tidy finish just on my uh, my underbody by here. OK. 
So we've got um, we've got our underbody, right? Everything now is going to be based on that underbody. And the reason for that is that it gives it a really good foundation. You wouldn't build a house without foundations. This is our foundation. Everything's going to grip to it. Um, I was tying cart flies earlier on this week. They're Teflon coated, PTFE Teflon coated. Um, and and you're, I needed a lot of wax because you start tying and your thread just slips round completely and everything. And it doesn't work as, as you would normally um, expect. So there we go. So in here, we've now got our underbody here. Notice, I don't know if you can see on this one, notice that I've left a couple of millimetres um, behind the eye as well, um, because that's my gauge, because I don't want to, I don't, do not want to tie any material past that point. If I tie any material past that point, I'm not going to be able to finish the fly. And you need more space than you think you need. Always leave a little bit more, okay? Because you can always play with it afterwards. But at this point, I've got everything in play. Okay, now this is a pheasant tail nymph. So here we go. Got this um, uh, 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 a pheasant tail. It's a cock pheasant. Um, this one came from, uh, well, this one came from a pheasant that had, had died um, in mysterious circumstances in the middle of a road just prior to uh, to when I arrived. Don't know why, don't know what happened, um, you know. So um, so at the end of the day, um, you know, um, feathers like this are really important. Um, I like this one because it's really long. I've got these really long sections here. Um, ultimately, and, and again, be careful when you're buying online because people... And even even well-known uh, manufacturers um, will produce feathers, um, but they'll be really short and stubby. OK, they're absolutely well, not useless, but <laughs> but they're not worth the money that you're going to pay for them. If you've got friends that, um, that find them, um, that's great. I've got a lad. I'm a school teacher and I've got a lad in school whose uh, dad is a gamekeeper um, and he just keeps bringing me bags of uh, of pheasant tail feathers it's absolutely fantastic um so uh, what we got there john what thread size is that it's a 12 or this one um uh it's uh the semperfly um wax thread 12 or um, you can find it on my website it's absolutely fantastic um it's there is part it's very much one of my go-to threads um so with the pheasant i don't know if you can see that you can see i haven't got the camera as i would really like it um, what we've got, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to separate out some sections here and I'm going to form a tail. So I want about um, 10 to 12 um, sections. So you could count them. I tend to. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. I've got 11 there. That'll do. I've got 11. Now I'm going to pull them out so that they are 90 degrees to the stem of the feather. Because that gets all of the points all at the same length. And then I'm just going to hold them down at the base and just give oop, a little pull. And then we've got the tag ends there. So what I'm going to do then is keep hold of them. And we've got our tailing material. There it is. There's our tailing material. Now the tails on most nymphs, um, you know, they move quite a lot. Um, and they're longer than you think. And I like a long um, a long tail on my flies, on my dries and on my nymphs, a lot, slightly longer than normal. That's mainly down to observation. Um, you know, when I was training as an environmental scientist and when uh, I've been doing river fly surveys, I'm always amazed at how the tail is actually longer than we always portray. Um, but obviously you don't want it sort of about 15 miles long. Rule of thumb, ultimately, is the length of the body. So you're looking for the length of the body. So offer it up and just judge it. You can always move it later on. And then I'm going to place it on the top of the hook and come in with my other hand and just hold it on the top of the hook like that. And then I'm going to bring my thread up and I'm going to pinch it between my finger and my thumb. And I'm... 
I've got no tension on it there at all. And then I'm going to bring it down. And then I'm not going to put any tension on it until I bring it back up for my second turn. What that does is it keeps it on top. It keeps it on top of the hook shank and it doesn't spin. If you go straight in, I find if you go straight in and you put in a lot of a lot of force initially, it's going to turn onto the other side. Um, and uh, and that's a bit of a wasted effort. You might have to start again. So I'm just going to put a third wrap on and a fourth to lock it in. Every wrap, for me, every wrap needs to have a purpose. Um, if it doesn't have a purpose, there's no point in it being there. So um, I, what I'm now going to do is start to build a body for my nymph. So I'm just now, I'm going to put a turn across and I'm going to bring my thread back up all the way to about two thirds of the way to there. Now the reason for this is because we're forming the body section, we're gonna have the abdomen, we're gonna have a, a, a thorax and a thorax cover that we're gonna place in here. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is find my scissors and I'm gonna come in at 45 degrees and give it a little Snip. Okay, and straight away, we've now got no bulk. We've got 11 barbules in there that form me a, a really nice tail. And then I'm just going to bring, just wrap my thread around. One of the things that you will find as a fly tire is that you will pull too hard, thinking that the bobbin needs to be really tight. Let gravity do the work. I tend to hold it finger and thumb. And just only put any effort in on the upstroke. On the downstroke, I'm going to let gravity do the job. And that way, I am not going to snap my thread. Now, notice I'm, I'm just moving it away from that hook point, like so. And then I'm just going to leave it to hang. I'm actually going to bring it a little bit further up, to be fair. There we go. All right, to, to that point. OK, um, so um, we've got the main bit in. Now, remember, this is a starting point. Insects are segmented. Now, to add segmentation, there are lots of methods, but we're going to use some copper wire. This is pretty fine copper wire. Um, I don't know where this came from, but I just found it in my box. Um, and I thought, ooh, that's, that could work really well here. Um, and what I'm going to use, um, remember I said I've got a chunky pair of scissors. These are my wire cutting scissors. I'm not going to use my good scissors, no matter how tempted I am, because I don't, I don't want to be explaining to Mrs. Roberts that actually I've had to buy more scissors. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my thread halfway up the body and I'm going to take my wire and you can follow the same technique that we did with the tail. Remember, technique is key. I'm going to place it along the length, just towards the top, along the length of the hook. I'm not going to put any effort in. I'm going to pinch it between my thumb and my forefinger. And then when I pull back up, I'm going to trap it in place and then put a second and a third locking turn and I've now got my rib trapped in place it will come out if I give it a pull it's not perfect at this point but what what we can now do is continue back gently no rush again I'm missing that hook point all the way back to the base of the tail that's now not going to move. That would need a lot of force to move that. And I'm going to bring my thread back up again to cover the rest of the end of the rib. There we go. And I've kept it. Ooh. 
going to have to work on my camera camera work here. Um, I've kept it so that we've now got a really uniform um, uh, body profile across here. There's no lumps. It's very, well, I hope not. There's no lumps. Um, and that's going to be great because it's not going to affect the next stages when we put the body in. OK, um, so um, what I am going to do now, though, is I'm just going to take my thread back up. And this is where tying thread becomes really, really important um, because you can use it to build up a taper on the body. OK, but we're going to do that in a second. I now need to go back to my pheasant tail feather. OK, and I'm going to use this to form the body. Now, I want about the same amount again, about 11 strands. So we've got about those there. And then I'm just going to pinch and pull. So that I've got all the tips together. And then this time I'm going to hold them by the tip. And I'm going to do exactly the same. I'm going to place the pheasant tail on the top. I'm going to pinch the hook. I'm going to bring up my thread, pinch it between my thumb and forefinger. It's all very loose. I'm going to bring it round and on the upstroke, I'm going to put the pressure in and it will keep it in one place. And I'm going to put a couple of locking turns in there because I don't want it to come out at this moment in time. And I've got my body material um, ready here. Um, now, you'll notice that where I've tied it in, there's a gap just behind here. Um, if you are if you get a vise that rotates, you can actually rotate and you can actually see that actually I need to go further back to the base of the tail to actually meet the base of the tail. One, two, three. Try and keep them touching turns if you can. Take your time. There's absolutely no rush. Speed comes later. Nobody, nobody's actually going to be bothered about how quickly you can tie a fly, even though people ask. Um, actually, they're interested in the fly itself. And I've got these sections here that I just need. I'm just going to bring them up as much as I can. Now, I wanted to form a taper. So what I'm going to do is when I get to the end of the body section, I'm just going to drag those back and trap them down with a couple of turns like so about halfway. And then I've got these other little end bits. So I'm not wasting them. I've got these other little end bits and I'm just going to bend them back again. Like so. Just trap them down a couple of turns and then I can come in and I'm just going to nip off these end bits because they'll just get in the way. I don't really want them. There we go. And now I can tidy up. I'm just going to tidy up minimum number of turns so that it hides the pheasant tail. Now it will form a taper and a step. To get too much of a step, just add a couple more turns in just to just to balance it out, and then come all the way back up to the end of the body section, like so. Okay, um, so um, so John says now you've got the body length. Why not move the hook back to hide the point so you don't risk snapping the thread on it? Um, well. First reason, John, is that I really don't want to change the anchor point. I've got it where I want it. I've, I've in my head psychologically, I've got my proportions worked out in my head. Um, secondly, on my particular vice, if I push it right back, um, what we end up physics does strange things, and what we end up with is putting too much force and pressure um, on the hook bend. And we can end up weakening it. And that could be the difference between landing a fish and losing a fish of a lifetime. Um, so um, I, I don't like bringing it too far back. I do not want to put too much pressure 
on that hook uh, on that hook bend that is going to be ultimately on this hook the weak point is that bend that's the point where the metallic bonds um, in the steel um, are, are going to be at their weakest because uh, because of the because of the bending process um, so ultimately you know leaving it out gives me a reference point um, and that's so that's that's the reason why I do that um, so that um, you know I hope that helps okay um, you can move it if you like it's up to you um, now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the body sections and I'm going to take my thread. I'm just going to get that out of the way. I'm going to make it a little bit longer, so keep the bobbin out of the way. And what I want to do is I want to wrap it around the hook, um, which sounds easier than it is. So I'm just going to hold it. I want to keep it. I don't want to put loads of force, loads of tension on it. Again, I'm going to let gravity do its job. You can you can twist it. Um, twist the uh, the pheasant tail um, but it naturally twists anyway um, also if you twist it before you do it you decrease the length of it so you might not have enough um, and then I'm going to bring it back up and I'm going to turn and I want them all in touching turns I don't want them to overlap if I can help it I want them in touching turns there we go back up I'm just going to bring my thread back because I moved it out of the way and then I'm going to bring it up once more and I'm going to trap it down I'm going to use gravity as my friend gravity is going to hold it and then I'm going to put a second lock in turn in and that's going to keep it there and then a third and a fourth just for peace of mind so we've developed our body okay at this point you can see the taper is in there and I'm going to come in with my scissors because I don't want this bit here. And I'm just going to snip it at 45 degrees. So snipping it at 45 degrees gives you a nice gradual taper back down to the eye. To the point at which we are, we're going to be building our thorax. Okay. Now, this is where our rib comes into play. Now the rib here does two things number one it allows segmentation to be part of possible trigger points for the fly but it also adds um, <laughs> a level of uh, of security for the fly and protection because trout have got sharp teeth i've had enough cuts from them when i've been gutting them over the years um, they've got sharp teeth um, and pheasant and uh, peacock and other materials they're not particularly robust. They're not particularly strong. So let's give it a nice little bit of protection. So I'm just going to... Sorry, I missed out a stage there. What I'm now going to do with it is I'm not going to um, uh, wrap it in the same direction as I would tie my wraps in. The reason for that is because um, what I don't want it to do is fall between the sections of the uh, of the pheasant um, where I've been wrapping them and you lose them you can't see them doesn't add any effect actually doesn't actually add anything to the fly so I'm going to bring it up I'm going to wrap this in the opposite direction now when you first start take it slowly you want equal spacing between them you want no more than four to five turns so that's three that's four and there's my fifth and I'm now going to bring my thread over let gravity trap it put a locking turn in and then I'm going to bring my wire so that it's in line with the shank and I'm going to cover it over with some thread to give it a bit of bulk I'm not going to go all the way to the end because now what I can do here, well, I could now snip it with my big scissors, but that would leave a tag end that's a pain in the bottom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wiggle it back and forth. And I'm going to use the weakness of ductile metals um, to great effect. And it snaps off and it's not sticking out. 
Um, put that to one side so you can reuse that. You can get a couple more flies out of that. Just tidy up the end. Like so. And all's good. Okay. Um, if you find at this point that you think, mm, I haven't got enough space, you can always go back and cover over some of the body to give yourself a bit more space um, for the thorax. Okay. So the thorax um, area... Um, don't make them really small please don't make them really small um, because actually again you look at the actual insects themselves um, the thorax area um, is actually quite a meaty area now what i'm going to need here is another piece of pheasant tail so this time um, i'm looking for again the same amount about 10 it's good to have an even number and i'll tell you why in a minute because um, we're going to use these to imitate legs as well so how many have I got here? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I need one more. Ten. Just makes it easier when we're trying to separate them and split them. Um, if we know that we've got ten of them there. And again, we go through the same process. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to get the tips so that they're meeting together. Hold it near the stem and give it a pull. Now, this is going to form our thorax cover and our legs. So for this, I'm looking to be able to have the tips here. It's just come out off camera there. Um, the tips, let me just move my device. There we go. The tips here, I'm going to double back, but I don't want them. I don't, don't want them to, to protrude all the way back to here. I want them to come back to just past the thorax area, so here. Okay, um, so I'm going to judge it and I'm going to make them long to start. I'm going to use my pinch wrap, no pressure, the upturn. There we go. And then I'm going to hold it down. All right, two wraps max on this. Don't want any more than that. Now, if I look at that and if I fold these back, they're going to go back. A long way so what I'm going to do is just going to give it a little pull to shorten the length out the front so maybe to match the length of the, the body material it's a bit of trial and error some will be longer than others okay it's a bit of trial and error then I'm looking at that and I'm thinking is that about right yeah I like that I like that Make a little bit more. There we go. And now I'm going to cover them over, making sure that any errant sections, if they if they spin up down and around, you just bring them to the top again. Stop. Bring them to the top again. Tighten it up. In we go like this. And then I'm going to bring my thread all the way back to the base. Now, the thorax material. I'm just going to trim. The tag ends off it. Reason for that is because, well, the reason for that, if I can find it, is that we're going to give them a bit of a hairbrush in a, in a moment. So now what I need now, OK, um, what I need now is uh, is some dubbing. OK, so dubbing comes in lots of different uh, styles. I've got some examples here. Uh, I've got some uh, some nice Semperfly here. Um, which is K-pop dubbing, um, which is great, great for dry flies. I'm not going to use that today. Um, I've got some uh, some Vicuna dubbing here, uh, the Hair's Ear Sub. Um, another great one that I use a lot. not going to use that today. What I'm going to use is some of this uh, Snowshoe Rabbit Foot dubbing here from Nature's Spirit. It's really soft, it's really light, um, and I I can build up. A nice thorax with it um, and what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to dub it and put it onto the thread itself down here okay um, which sounds more complicated than it is um, less is more so you just want a little pinch of dubbing you don't want a massive amount and then I'm just going to put it onto and pinch it so that it 
sort of sticks to my thread like that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my thumb and my finger, my fourth finger, and I'm just going to rub it. And when you rub it, it seems to form this nice little, little, what we call a noodle. And I'm just going to twist it onto it. And the thread, the, the thread twists initially, and then it goes back again. But the noodle itself, if you get just keep putting pressure on it. The noodle itself just gets thinner and thinner. And then I'm going to push it up. There we go. And that's all there is to dubbing. Okay, it takes a bit of practice. But if you find that it's still not sticking, just wet your, your finger and your thumb on your tongue. And then that will help it a little bit as well. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to put in a turn and I'm going to build up touching turns all the way to the front. And I'm going to bring it back and I'm going to add a little bit more dubbing. Now it's always better to add dubbing than it is to take dubbing away. Okay, so I'm going to add more, same way, give it a press, give it a push, a twist, just move it up. I'm going to build up there. I want it a little bit, a little bit thicker than that. I want it a bit chunky. Again, I'm going to add a little bit. You can always add dubbing. What, what you can't do very easily is take dubbing away. Um, so adding little and often is key. And again, I'm just going to build it up. And I'm going to bring it back down like that. Now, here I've tied in the legs at this end. You could do it the other way around, okay? But I, I want um, a really nice thorax here. So I'm just going to give this a brush to separate out the barbules. And then I'm going to take the thorax material and I'm going to bring it across the top of the thorax and I'm going to put a turn in to hold it down and then I'm going to put a second turn in just to lock it in place. It does like my beard doesn't it? I'm going to have to work on get back into the swing of getting it focused again. There we go. Okay, now I've put two turns in there. Remember I said less is more with turns. And I'm just going to come in and I'm just going to nip off at 45 degrees those extra little bits. And it's all nice and neat now. And then I'm just going to put in a final turn just there. Now what I'm going to do is, remember I counted 10 here. I want five on one side. So don't worry if you don't get it perfectly. Two, three, four. There you go. Got five on the left hand side and five on the right. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring them back so that they're along the sides. They're along the sides of the body. And then I'm just going to build up at this end a head. I'm just going to bring it across and just build up a head and trap them down so that they lie along the sides. Okay, so we've got some leggy appendages here. 
I'm already looking at this fly thinking, you know what, I could have made that thorax a bit longer, uh, um, you know, and the thorax cover could have been a bit longer, but I'm liking what I'm seeing, I, that'll catch fish. Um, notice I haven't put a bead on it at all yet, um, and I'm not planning to, but I've built up, built up this nice head here, and I don't need to do too much more with that. And the head is as good as I want it to be. So now what I'm going to do is going to use my whip finish tool. Um, so I'm just going to, well, they'll, they'll, I'll put up a video on how to how to do this. Uh, it be easier. But I'm just going to use the whip finish tool to put in one, two, three turns. And tighten it off. Give it a bed it down and then I'm just going to put in another three just for peace of mind one two three and we're done push it up and I've got my I've got my finished fly or almost finished fly now I'm going to open my scissors again slight little V I'm just going to come in on my thread and I'm just going to push if I snip, I end up with a tag end and it looks unsightly. I'm just going to give it a little push like that. Um, and then we're going to have a look at that and think, mm, OK, what else could I do here? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of Velcro. Now, I've got a, a, a Stonfo brush here, Velcro brush. I don't normally use it, to be fair. Um, I much prefer my lolly stick with a bit of Velcro stuck on it. Um, and I'm just going to rub it lightly across the dubbing and I'm going to tease it out and it makes it far more buggy looking okay try not to overdo it just a light gentle movement back and forth and there we have it okay so yeah so as Dave says in the chat you know the reason i left that space at the beginning is so that i can get this heading okay to finish the actual fly um, without it um you would be end up finishing right down here and you'll end up coming off the uh, off the end of the hook on the end of the eye um and it, it's just really frustrating um now the, the final stage is and the bit i didn't mention right at the beginning uh, I'll just lean across, got to look and get the, what's that one, Is that one? yes, that's the one I want. Um, I'm going to use, I, I now need to just make sure that none of those wraps are going to come out um, uh, on the head. So I'm going to use some, some, uh, uh, some um, head cement. Um, my favoured one is the Vineyards um, Cellier Varnish. Uh, this is clear, you get them in all different colours, um, but this is clear. I like it because actually, unlike varnishes like Sally Hansen and things like that, which are nail varnishes, which are designed to sit on the top of materials and, and obviously nails, this is formulated to sink into the wraps, into the thread, um, and, uh, and actually does a far better job um, at this point. Um, to apply this, I'm going to use a needle. OK, I'm forever raiding um, haberdashers and things like that. And I'll look at needles and go, I could I need another pack of the needles. I don't. I just like doing it. Um, and I'm just going to dip it into the pot. And I'm going to get a little bead of varnish. And this is where a rotating vice is really quite useful. Because what I don't want to do is get it in the eye, if I can help it. It's not the end of the world if I do, but I don't want to. And I'm just going to apply it. Little stroke. On both sides. And just apply it gently. There's no rush. Remember, it's not about speed. It's about technique. And practice. And I'm just going to make sure I've got all of that. There we go. And I'm just going to let that dry. And 
and it gives it a nice sheen as well it makes it look really cool um and uh, but if you are going to use a colored varnish i would i would say um put the clear on first um and then <coughs> then apply sorry then apply um any colored varnish if you're going to color it um at the front end um you know um You'll find out why if you ever try it. You know, the black, for instance, is so thick sometimes and, and viscous that it just doesn't quite go where you want it to. And it ends up staining all of the thorax area. OK, so we have there um, a, a very simple, a very nice pheasant tail nymph. Um, no bead required. OK, um, and um, actually they're underused, I find. And I do believe that, that we should bring back the unweighted nymph for us nymph fishermen. The unweighted nymph, because um, everything's now heavy tungsten, lots of beads on it. Um, it's just something really quite, um, quite lovely about a slow sinking uh, and, and just a nymph that's just going to travel through the water column. Fish are going to come and find it, um, you know, whereas we're not just sticking it on the bottom and just hoping that a fish is going to see it as we bring it up through the water column. Um, but also on the river as well, you know, just floating it down, getting the fish to come up towards it. Um, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that um, that I think is underrated at the moment. And I think, um, well, not think I would know that um, Sawyer and Skews would be going, oh, my God, they're putting beads on there again. Um, so let's bring back the unweighted nymph, folks. Um, Try it, have a go with it. What I will do during the course of the week is I will do a proper time video of it that, um, that is a bit clearer, um, but to give you an opportunity um, to have a go. And we'll try and get a step-by-step um, -step up as well um, over the course of the next week, if possible. Okay, so um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it's been worthwhile. Um, I, I hope lots of people are going to watch it later on um, on, on as Paul said uh, on Lost Lake Fly Plus One, it will be up on uh, my YouTube channel as well. So if I haven't mentioned it, um, do a search, find it, Lost Lake Fly. If somebody wants to put up the link in the uh, in the chat, that'd be great. Um, you know, like, subscribe, more subscribers, um, the better. Uh, the the more the more incentivized I become in actually um, uh, uh, to actually make more videos um it is time consuming um so um yeah so that's it for tonight um thank you all for joining me um oh dan we got a question from dan so when fishing under a dry do you tie to the bend of the hook direct to the tippet leader or leave the dry as a dropper um it's a tough one dan because down here on the chalk streams we're not allowed to do that so we don't do it we can't um but um you know there's no, absolutely nothing wrong um with with um tying it directly um to the bend of the hook um uh droppers i'd use tippet rings these days for droppers because it's just easier um but uh but yeah ptn dial backs are definitely a go-to crunches um things like that um Pheasant don't don't um, underestimate the gold ribbed hairs here either. Um, they are mimics of something and nothing and everything in the same way that the PTM was designed in that way. Um, Sawyer's killer bug as well. Absolutely deadly. Um, so make sure that, um, that you have a go at those. And that's that's even easier to tie. Um, you know, but it does involve a lot of copper wire. Um, so um, any questions? I'll try and answer other things as we go along. Um, Next week, um, I think I've got I'll, I'll put something up for next week, um, but we'll um, I think um, it was voted for for more work with deer hair and things like that. OK, um, in terms of uh, in terms. No, Dan, I haven't been back to me on yet. I haven't been down there. I haven't managed to get there yet, but I will. But thanks for dropping it off for me. I'm really interested to uh, to have a play with that, particularly on some shrimp patterns I've got in my in my head. Um, but as you've probably seen. Um, we've been having some fun with the carp recently and uh, and just getting out of the heat and then not not annoying the trout and we'll come back to them at some point. Um, 
thanks a lot folks it's all good um if you need anything else just let me know um check out the website check out the lost lake fly dot co dot uk for center fly materials and lots of other cool materials up there um that we've got in stock um and i look forward to seeing you all next week take care